Okay, uh, so let me welcome uh, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our uh, weekly astrophysics seminar. Uh, this week, we have um, the pleasure of hosting um, Dr. David Aguilera Dena. Uh, David uh, uh, completed his undergraduate studies at the National Autonomous University in Mexico. And then he moved to the Argerlander Institute of Astrophysics in uh, Bonn, at the University of Bonn. Of course, he completed both his master's and just very recently, a few days ago, um, his PhD degree. So we are getting his first lecture um, as a PhD scientist, we're really <laughs> happy about it. And we're hoping to uh, soon actually welcome him here at the Institute of Astrophysics. Uh, David is an expert on uh, astrophysical transients and on their progenitors. And this is what he's going to talk to us about today. So without any further ado, David, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vasu. So uh, as Vasu said, I'm going to tell you about uh, uh, progenitor stars for hydrogen and helium deficient astrophysical transients. Uh, this relates to massive stars. And as uh, she also said, I will probably be joining the team in Crete unofficially, I guess I can say that, uh, soon. So, you know, if anything comes up that you're interested in or anybody has any sort of interest on stellar physics in general, uh, please consider me to be the person to, uh, you know, work with about that. Uh, anyway, without further ado, let me tell you a little bit about what this long, and uh, probably strange title means. Uh, I will first start with like an introduction to make things make a little bit more sense. Uh, I'll spend a couple of words about uh, telling you how I've done the things I will be telling you about. Uh, and then I will be telling you about the two separate projects that have been my uh, what I've spent most of my time on in uh, the past couple of years uh, relating to massive stars and their transients and then end with a little summary. Uh, but then to begin, of course, the natural question to ask is what is an astrophysical transient to make sense of the title that I was uh, uh, giving you before. So a supernova is probably the most common astrophysical transit that we observe. They occur, at least in our galaxy, something about once every 50 years, more or less, although uh, we don't really get to see all of them. Uh, and these take place, or many of them, occur when a massive star reaches the end of its life. So here in the left, you're seeing a, a picture of a galaxy, one of the Messier objects. Uh, when it's doing nothing, just sitting around, uh, waiting for time to pass. And then at some point, uh, what happens when a, a transient takes place, uh, in this case a supernova, is that a uh, very bright source of radiation appears suddenly in this galaxy. It's typically or often as luminous or more luminous than the entire rest of the galaxy uh, before the explosion. And um, yeah, they, like for example, a typical la supernova has a luminosity of 10 to the nine solar luminosities or like a billion times the luminosity of the sun. They release a typical energy of 10 to the 51 ergs, which to give an idea of what that means, it's roughly the energy that the sun will have uh, radiated after the end of its life. So in the, I don't know, 10 billion years that it's going to live, it's going to radiate the amount of energy that is seen in a supernova. But this happens in a typical duration of about 50 to 150 days. And these characteristics are typical for all astrophysical transients. They are luminous, they are energetic, and they have a typical duration that is very short in astrophysical terms. Now, the question that I would like to answer is how do stars make transients that we see? So there's a, a picture that most people have in mind uh, when they think about massive stars and how they evolve. 
and it all starts uh, in you know gas clouds that are found in the interstellar medium the nebulae uh, just like the movie from lady gaga whenever these things collapse a star is born and when a star is born uh, <laughs> it's born mostly made out of hydrogen as you can see here, the hydrogen fraction for stars in the neighborhood of the sun is around 74%, and the helium is about 24%. And the rest of the things that are in a star at its birth uh, makes up about 2%, which is what we call metallicity. It makes up everything else from lithium to uh, whatever is the largest element that is inside a massive star. And now, the way that a massive star lives and evolves is that uh, they burn hydrogen in their core, and this keeps them in energetic equilibrium because they burn as much hydrogen that they need to make up for the energy that they lose at their surface because of radiation. At some point, of course, uh, they run out of hydrogen in their core, and this leads the star to become colder at the surface and uh, of a larger radius. This is what we call a red supergiant star. So the way that we the way that we look at this uh, from the point of view of stellar evolution is probably with this, uh, our most important plot, which is called the uh, HR diagram, which gives us uh, the luminosity of a star as a function of its surface temperature, of its effective temperature. And just to point out that the x-axis here is inverted, so it goes from high to low, and they're both in log scale. Uh, and here in this plot, we see uh, this line here, which we call the zero H main sequence. It's the line where stars are born, and depending on their mass, stars are born, you know, higher mass being more luminous. But all stars are born in this region so here mass, yeah. of, the, of the HR diagram. Uh, so this is an example of a star exactly at birth. And then during the lifetime that it has uh, burning hydrogen, which is around 90% of its total lifetime, uh, it just spends its life in this region mostly. Uh, and then when it reaches the state where it uh, runs out of hydrogen after the main sequence, it quickly evolves from this point to what we know as the red giant branch. And a typical star will live here for the rest of 10% of its life and then explode as a supernova when it reaches uh, a certain point. So you might be wondering, what is this point? Or why does a massive star have to explode? So as I said, stars initially burn hydrogen to helium. And then when they are in the red supergiant branch, they burn helium into heavier elements. And at the end, their core, which is a very, very tiny region of the star here, uh, amplified in this little cartoon, uh, is composed of layers of different compositions. And each layer has an element that is heavier than the previous one in general. Um, so we have like a hydrogen layer and then a helium shell, carbon shell, oxygen shell, silicon shell. And then we get to produce an iron core, but the iron core cannot contribute to generating energy inside the star because uh, burning iron doesn't really generate energy. Uh, so what happens is that as soon as it grows uh, large enough, it becomes so uh, like massive enough that it cannot really sustain itself uh, against the force of gravity, and it collapses. And as the core of a star collapses, a new neutron star is born in the core of a star. And the release of gravitational energy from going from a a few thousand kilometer uh, iron core to going to a 15, 10 kilometer neutron star might uh, have enough, like release enough energy to release the outer layers of the star, resulting in what we see as a supernova or um, transient coming from a massive star. Uh, there's a problem with this picture here that I want to talk to you about. We call it the red supergiant problem. Uh, in this plot that we're looking at, we see the observed or the inferred uh, initial masses of uh, massive stars that have been observed to explode as supernovae. So we observe a supernova 
where somebody observes a supernova and then uh, they look for images of the same field before the supernova took place and uh, try to uh, infer what is the mass of the star that exploded. And what we see here is that we have a clear distribution, which uh, most stars are between perhaps six, seven, eight solar masses to around 1920. Uh, but then we observe uh, red supergiants that are more luminous than the most luminous supernova that we observe to explode, which means probably that some red supergiants don't become supernovae. And this is true for like several types of massive stars. This is an example of uh, a massive star that was observed to just disappear, uh, which leads us to infer that although many of the transients that we know about come from massive stars, not all massive stars uh, create transients or explode a supernovae and instead collapse directly into a massive black hole. So now I have to tell you a little bit about what kinds of transients we have, because uh, as you may remember from the title that I gave you, I will be talking about specifically those that are hydrogen and helium deficient. Uh, so supernovae are classified according to their light curves, which tells us a bit about how much energy uh, they release during the explosion but also their spectra, which tells us uh, about the temperature at the photosphere of the expanding explosion, and also about the composition uh, of the star before it exploded and as it continues to explode. Uh, so supernovae are basically classified into two large groups, those that do not show hydrogen in their spectrum and those that show hydrogen in their spectrum. Uh, so those that don't have it are called type 1, and those that do are called type 2. Type 2 supernovae are subdivided into several classes that you can see here, uh, depending on their light curve properties and some features of their spectra. Uh, but I'm not going to go into detail because those are not the ones that I'm going to be talking about. But type 1 supernovae are divided into type 1a, 1b, and 1c, which are the most common ones and 1c broadline and the superluminous 1c, which are the very rare ones. Um, as you can see maybe from the little boxes here, they're subdivided by their spectral properties. And I want to spend a second talking about 1b supernovae, which show helium lines, uh, but they are distinct to type 1a supernovae in the sense that they don't show silicon features. And the 1c supernovae, which only show lines from uh, elements uh, higher than helium. So they have no hydrogen and no helium, uh, but instead intermediate elements like carbon and oxygen. Um, then we have the broadline type 1c supernovae, which are a subclass of the type 1c, uh, which are distinguished by broadline emission, which means that they're uh, the material that is ejected during the explosion has a lot of kinetic energy, maybe 10 to 100 times larger than a normal 1C supernovae. And this uh, special type are often accompanied by what, by what we know as gamma ray bursts, which are bursts of gamma rays, as the name implies, that uh, release a, an insane amount of energy, maybe as much as a supernova or 10 or 100 times more but in a time scale of perhaps less than a second to something of uh, the order of a thousand seconds. So this is a very peculiar and very, very energetic event. Uh, and then we have the superluminous type 1c supernovae, which are also rare and they are distinguished by being very, very luminous, perhaps 10, 100 times brighter than a normal type 1c supernovae. Uh, and both the type 1c broadline and the gamma ray bursts that they come with and the superluminous supernovae uh, are particular in the sense that they're very energetic and also rare and happen in low metallicity environments. Uh, and of course, they are all, except for type 1a supernovae, inferred to come from uh, massive stars. So another thing, another thing that is very important to to what I'm going to be talking about is that we know more or less the rates of these types of supernova or the relative rates. Uh, at least uh, they're quite well measured in the 
nearby universe close to our galaxy. And we observe that, as you can see in this little pie chart here, around 20% of the supernovae that we observe are hydrogen and helium deficient, or well, some are hydrogen and some are hydrogen and helium deficient. Uh, and uh, coming from the point of view of uh, stellar physics, this is a very, very puzzling fact because 99.9% .9 of all stars are composed 99% of hydrogen and helium. So what has to happen to a star in order to produce these transients and what has to happen uh, that is such a common thing that 20% of the transients are, uh, are in this group here is the question that I'm going to be mainly trying to, to answer. And there's we have some ideas of how this might happen. We observe stars that have no hydrogen and some that have very little or no helium. These are known as wolf -Rayet stars. And in the canonical picture of stellar evolution, this come from very massive stars that lose their envelopes via uh, stellar winds. So here I'm showing some uh, simulations of uh, massive stars that have different masses here labeled in these black numbers. And they experience winds through their evolution. Uh, and the winds are so strong that they manage to remove the hydrogen envelope that is on top of, uh, of the mass of stars. Uh, which uh, then gives us this uh, observational classes that we see, the W and L and W and E type wolf rayet stars, which uh, show nitrogen lines, and the WC type stars, which show carbon lines. So for many years, it was believed that most wolf rayet stars were coming from the winds of massive stars, and that perhaps uh, it was these stars that gave rise to the type 1b and type 1c supernovae that we observe in, in our local universe. But since you can see, these are coming from very, very massive stars. This is uh, 60 solar masses. We just don't have enough of those to explain the numbers of uh, type 1b and type 1c supernovae that we know. So this leads me to how I've pursued to answer the question, where are these transients coming from? So what I have done is uh, mostly do models of massive stars as they evolve using uh, one-dimensional uh, numerical simulations of massive star evolution with a call, uh, code called MESA, which usually uh, it, uh, basically takes the fact that stars are roughly spherical and uses it to its advantage to map the spherical structure of a star to a 1D uh, array that contains properties of the star that we can then calculate as a function of time. And we can calculate things like the radius for a given uh, enclosed mass and the pressure, the local luminosity, temperature, composition in every layer of the star, among other quantities, and then see how they evolve as a function of time using the physics that we know that uh, dominates the evolution of massive stars. Uh, the first project that I've done that I want to tell you about is on the origin of type 1b and type 1c supernovae, so the normal kind that we observe in our local universe. Um, and the idea that we think is dominating how these uh, events take place is that they come from not the very massive stars that lose their winds through uh, their envelope through winds, but on a second process that we know as binary stripping, which uh, is sort of exemplified in this nice picture here. Uh, the idea is that stars are born in pairs. And we know today that most massive stars are actually born in pairs around maybe 60, 70% of all of them. And around 60% of those, as you can see in this little pie chart here, will interact at some point during their evolution. So most massive stars are in pairs, and most pairs of stars, or binary systems as we call them, interact at some point during their lifetimes. And this interaction can lead for massive stars to lose their hydrogen envelope, and uh, then perhaps be uh, help us to be able to explain the numbers of uh, hydrogen-free supernovae that we observe. 
Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about how I did the simulations that went into this project. So we modeled grids of uh, helium stars of different masses and with different metallicities, uh, thinking that these stars were the result of a previous uh, binary uh, interaction event between two massive stars, and then evolve uh, roughly like a single star that is made up mostly of helium. So helium burning takes place in a star that has a structure like the one you're seeing here, where we have a core that is burning helium and has mostly carbon and oxygen, and it has an envelope that is made up of helium and nitrogen. So in principle, this would probably be observed as a WN type star, uh, which I told you about a second ago. But these stars, a thing that really affects the way that they evolve is that they experience very, very strong mass loss. In fact, uh, these late stages of evolution, uh, we think that have the greatest amount of mass loss in the whole life of a massive star. And if this is strong enough, which will depend on the luminosity of the star and also on its metallicity, uh, we will be able to, or the star will be able to get rid of all of its uh, helium and nitrogen enriched envelope and expose the layers above it, uh, below this envelope, which are enriched in carbon and oxygen, which then we would be able to observe as a WC type star or these Wolf rays that have a, a carbon in their surface. And then those that are not luminous enough or in a low metallicity environment will evolve uh, as the same as they were born in this after they were stripped from their hydrogen envelope. And we will observe them all of their lives as a WN type star in principle. However, there's another caveat that goes into, oh, right, <laughs> sorry, I forgot I was gonna tell you a little bit about this. So this is two examples of, uh, two of the stars that we modeled. So this is very similar to the picture that we're seeing here, but in a lot more detail. So this is uh, what we call a keep in hand diagram, which has uh, the time before the collapse of the iron core in the x-axis as a function of, uh, or uh, in log scale. So here we have 10 to the five years before collapse, 10 to the four, et cetera. And then on the uh, x-axis, in the y-axis, we see the mass coordinate of the star. So here, this would represent the surface of the star. And below this line is the interior of the star. And the color represents the amount of energy that is either being generated in red or lost from these layers in blue, lost uh, because of the intense emission of neutrinos that these stars uh, experience during their lives. And the shaded regions are convective regions which correspond to uh, burning layers of the star. And these are two stars that are in different metallicity environments. So the thing that we can uh, already see is how metallicity deeply influences how stars uh, or helium stars lose their hydrogen, uh, their, after losing their hydrogen envelope, their metallicity basically determines how they're going to evolve. So a star in low metallicity will end up with probably half of its mass at the end, and it will have a helium layer that is uh, empty of uh, carbon and oxygen, or full of carbon and oxygen and empty of uh, nitrogen, I'm sorry. Whereas a star at higher metallicity will end up with a much smaller mass and will transition between this WN and WC phases a lot earlier in its evolution. There's a caveat in this, uh, thing I discussed where we relate carbon-rich stars and nitrogen-rich stars to the wolf rayet stars that we observe with different compositions. And this is uh, the fact that in different metallicity environments, we observe different types of wolf rayet stars. What I'm saying here or is shown by these three uh, diagrams, these three HR diagrams where we see uh, the known wolf rayet stars in the Small Magellanic Cloud, this Large Magellanic Cloud and the Milky Way. Uh, these three galaxies have progressively higher metallicity, which is uh, shown in these little labels here. And as metallicity increases, we see that the lower limit in luminosity at which we observe uh, wolf rayet stars to appear 
decreases, which means that in the Milky Way, we will see more uh, wolf radiated stars because they will be found at lower metallicities than in lower uh, environments. So first, before trying to use the models that we made to say something about these populations, we have to take this fact into account. And the way that we have done this is by characterizing the optical depth of these stars at their surface, because the thing that distinguishes a wolf radiated star from what would be a normal helium star or yeah, a non wolf radiated type helium star is that they have optically thick winds. So the winds are so strong and so dense that they become opaque. And what we see in the characteristic spectra of these stars is emission lines that come from this optically thick wind. Uh, and we can characterize the optical depth at the surface of the stars using relationships that we know about from how dense or how strong the mass loss is, which relates to how dense their environment is and how luminous they are, which depends on the metallicity and on the mass loss rates of these stars. And combining all these things together, we were able to predict that the transition between optically thin or transparent and optically thick uh, or opaque, which would imply that the star would be observable as a wolf rayet, uh, is somewhere along this band here, uh, which corresponds very well to the observations that we that I showed you in the previous slide. Um, using this information, we were able to take the models of uh, helium stars that we produced and predict to some with some uncertainty, but to predict that the ratio of these two types of stars, so the number of WC stars per one WN type star, will increase as metallicity increases, and it will steeply increase around solar metallicity and then come to some sort of uh, equilibrium value, perhaps, uh, in very high metallicity environments, such as that of uh, perhaps the very, very deep parts of the Milky Way or galaxies that are more evolved. Uh, but now what I want to tell you about is how we use these models to think about what happens to massive stars when they die. So this was roughly uh, an idea before of how these stars will live, and now I'm going to tell you how they're going to die. And I think to know about what kinds of stars make supernovae that we observe is that we can measure the masses that are ejected from explosions uh, when they take place, uh, which is shown here for the different types of uh, supernovae or of these types of supernovae in uh, cumulative distribution function. Um, and we can see what is the average mass and what is the distribution of these masses from here from this plot. So we see that type 1c supernovae have an average ejecta mass of 2.1 solar masses, which matches the fact that I told you before that most of these stars cannot be coming just from the winds of massive stars because they would be very, very massive, a lot more massive than you know, 2.1 solar masses. Uh, and the same is true for type 1b supernovae, which are slightly more massive than the type 1c's. Uh, so this brings us back to how do these helium stars look like when they die or when they reach the end of their evolution. So here I'm plotting, or I'm showing you a figure with uh, the final mass of helium stars as a function of their initial mass as helium stars, which will be connected to their mass at birth in the main sequence. Uh, and then colored for the different metallicities that we modeled to, uh, to be able to infer what kind of stars are exploding in this regime and what they look like when they explode. So we see here that there is a line where this trend uh, changes, and this corresponds to the line where stars either live all of their lives as WN type stars, so that's nitrogen rich surfaces, to those that will transition into WC type stars, which are predicted to have uh, stronger mass loss rates at the end of their life, which is why their final masses tend to be shorter or smaller than those of uh, WN type stars. And taking this uh, combined with 
how many of these stars we expect to be born, we could predict how many of them we're going to observe in a normal galaxy. But as I discussed before, uh, in a normal galaxy, uh, we don't observe all stars to explode. Some will implode and create uh, massive black holes and some will successfully explode and uh, become supernovae. And a way that we can determine which one is which is by performing several tests uh, of what we call the explodability of massive stars. Uh, here I'm showing one, uh, which basically means that we're measuring this thing called the compactness parameter, which is a very, very simple measurement of at the moment when the star begins to collapse, uh, what is the binding energy more or less of its core? So the way that we measure this is by measuring at the coordinate where the star is two and a half solar masses, what is the radius of this coordinate? So we can see that this is indeed the binding energy in average of the first two and a half solar masses of the star. Uh, and we know that if the compactness is low, generally below 3.5 or so, these stars will explode and we will be able to observe them as either type 1b or type 1c supernovae. Uh, but if they, they are too compact in their core, they will not explode and instead form massive black holes. Uh, and there you can see that there is a window or a sort of regime in intermediate final masses where the compactness is high, uh, which we have to take into account to be able to make any statistics about which stars will explode or not. But when we do that, we combine the rate of birth of these stars with how they end their lives, how many massive stars are born, how many are stripped, etc. We are able to, to estimate what's gonna, how this ratio of type 1c to type 1b supernovae is going to change as the universe evolves. And what we find, which is uh, not necessarily trivial, is that uh, we will observe more type 1c's than type 1b's as the universe becomes much more metal rich. And another thing that we were able to do, do using this uh, statistical study and combined with our models is that we were able to explain this data that uh, is similar to the one I showed you a few minutes ago. So the cumulative distribution functions of ejecta masses of supernovae. And we're able to match this distribution roughly, but only in environments that have very high metallicity. So this is higher than solar metallicity, uh, which hints to the fact that indeed the metal the metallicity dependent winds will play a very important role in the evolution of these stars. But since the masses that we predict in solar metallicity are lower than those that we observe, then perhaps there are more mechanisms that come into play. And another thing that we can predict from our models is perhaps the distribution of neutron star masses uh, that result from the production of all these events, uh, which is given here as a histogram. So we see that the observed distribution of neutron star masses is double peaked, but the predicted uh, distribution from our models just peaks here at this point, combining from all of the type 1b and type 1c supernovae. And the mean uh, neutron star masses that we predict will be lower for type 1b supernovae than for type 1c supernovae, regardless of the metallicity. This is like some of the things that uh, we can learn from, from the models that I was discussing. Um, and a striking thing that we were able to do using these models or models very similar to these, is that we were able to, to my knowledge for the first time, reproduce the spectra of observed type 1c in red and type 1b supernovae uh, and a few intermediate cases which are sort of undecided observationally uh, without you know, any further adjustments or modifications. So this is a very robust channel that will probably form the population of supernovae that we see. So to conclude this little first part and then move on to the next, we were able to uh, predict what is the minimum luminosity at which wolf ray stars can be observed depending on their surface properties and their, their mass loss rates. 
Uh, we using this, we're able to calculate, for example, the ratio of WC to WN stars as a function of metallicity and see that it's going to increase. Um, we were also able to calculate through the same way the ratio of type 1c to type 1b supernovae as the universe becomes more metal rich. And we were able to roughly match the distribution of type 1c ejecta masses, given a few caveats, of course. Uh, but this will perhaps be a very powerful tool to understand uh, how this binary evolution takes place in, in different metallicity environments in the universe and how this affects the transients that we see. And now this that I've just told you about concerns the normal type of supernovae that we observe most typically in the local universe. But now I want to tell you a little bit about the more energetic and more sort of puzzling transients that we see, which uh, I told you about earlier, the superluminous supernovae and gamma ray bursts. Uh, these two these two types of transients have a lot of things in common, even though observationally they are very, very different. We know that they come from high mass stars. It has been inferred for both of them that they come from uh, massive stars that rotate very, very fast. So in, this, in the case of a superluminous supernova, we believe that they are very, very bright because instead of forming a typical neutron star uh, during the explosion or during the collapse of the core, it forms a very fast spinning neutron star with a very strong magnetic field or a magnetar. And this will provide the energy to make the star very, very bright. And in the case of gamma ray bursts, we believe that it's the case where a massive star collapses that is very fast rotating, but instead of producing a magnetar or a fast spinning neutron star, it produces a fast spinning black hole. Uh, a black hole that will reach critical spin as it accretes the mass that is falling from the star that exploded. And as it reaches this critical spin, it cannot accrete anymore. And it produces two jets uh, that if they are aligned to our line of sight, we will observe as a gamma ray burst. Uh, and something else that they have in common is that they are preferentially found in low metallicity environments and they are both hydrogen and helium free. So this brings us to a third method or a third process that can make a star be rid of its uh, hydrogen envelope, which uh, both of these transients do not possess, and that is mixing. So when stars uh, are born, when stars are born, as I said before, they will be born somewhere with this surface temperature and the luminosity, and then they will evolve during their hydrogen burning lifetime in this uh, part here. And then they will reach the supergiant branch and explode as a red supergiant. This is a normal star. But when a star rotates uh, very fast, rotation can induce uh, mixing processes in the interior that will make the star become uh, more compact and a lot more luminous as it evolves. And it will bring all of the hydrogen from the envelope through this mixing course, uh, process into the core where the hydrogen is burnt. Uh, this is an idea, or this was an idea for a long time of how uh, gamma ray bursts could be born. And we found through some stellar simulations that stars that undergo this uh, evolutionary channel where they mix all of their hydrogen into their core and then become fast rotating helium stars, essentially, uh, they will lose a lot of mass during their lives. So this is a, a figure of the mass loss rate of one of these stars as a function of its remaining lifetime before it collapses. Uh, and we can see that uh, the for the most of its life, it's very, very low, except for this burst here that takes place at the end of, uh, of its hydrogen burning lifetime. But a few thousand years before its collapse, uh, it will lose a lot, a lot of mass. And this is because we found that these stars will contract very quickly and the contraction will accelerate their rotation just uh, in the way that, you know, when a figure skater is spinning and then they pull their arms closer to their body, they uh, reduce their moment of inertia, which causes their uh, spin period to increase. 
And this will happen progressively faster and faster at the end of the evolution of these massive stars because they will uh, emit or they will lose a lot of energy uh, through neutrino emission, which takes place at the end of the life of uh, massive stars. Uh, and it will be able to respond to this because it will not have a hydrogen envelope that will uh, make the star expand while its core contracts. Uh, this means that when the star is ready to explode, it will encounter a very, very massive uh, or a very, very dense circumstellar medium, which was formed in its last thousand years, which is a prediction that we make to sort of like in the sense that if this model is true, then this uh, very, very late mass loss should make a signature in observations. Um, we also are able to model the magnetic fields of these fast rotating stars uh, because rotation induces a dynamo process in which uh, the lines of magnetic fields are stretched and amplified via dynamo whenever we have uh, differential rotation, which we can see here. So on the left y-axis, we see the intensity of magnetic field. And on the right, we see the spin period, which is plotted here in red for uh, an initially eight solar mass star, which has lost uh, most of its mass and is, uh, or like there's almost three solar masses of uh, material and is about ready to explode. And we see that in the places where there's a lot of change, in the spin period of the star, there's also a very intense magnetic field of the order of 10 to the nine Gauss. Uh, and then we can, I'm sorry. <laughs> and then we can sort of figure out if this magnetic field will be enough to power the explosions that we observe. So, but these models are probably able to explain both superluminous supernovae and gamma ray bursts. So there has to be a way to differentiate them uh, and to be able to find out which way that is, uh, we performed the same explodability tests as I discussed on, uh, in a few slides back. And we proposed that those stars that evolve in this channel and have low compactness will be able to explode, uh, forming a powerful magnetar that will result in a superluminous supernova. And those that do not manage to explode will instead form a critically rotating black hole and will be observed as a gamma ray burst that is accompanied by a uh, broad line type 1c supernova uh, that comes from the interaction between uh, the ejected material from the jets and the rest of the star. Uh, we are able to compare this with observations. Uh, this is probably the most robust comparison that we can do between the data and our models. So from our models, right before they collapse, we can infer how much mass they will eject, assuming that they uh, produce a normal mass neutron star or a normal mass magnetar. And then looking at the rotation profile in their interiors, we can see how fast this magnetar will be spinning, just assuming that uh, the angular momentum is conserved during the collapse and uh, that it has some moment of inertia and some radius. That is also an assumption, but it's not very dependent on, um, on or like the assumption is not very strongly affecting our results. Uh, and here we can see how the spin periods of the observed uh, superluminous supernova inferred from modeling them as coming from a magnetar uh, in the back in green compared to the results that we obtained from our models here in the pentagons, which are colored by their initial mass. And we see that we are not only able to reproduce the range where we observe, but also this trend where we see that uh, lower ejecta masses mean higher spin periods. Uh, and another thing that we can compare roughly perhaps to the things that are inferred from the observations of superluminous supernovae is the magnetic fields, as I said. So assuming the same that the neutron star, the magnetar that is formed, is formed by the contraction of uh, uh, the iron core, we can calculate what is the average uh, strength of magnetic field in this iron core, and then map it to what it would be, assuming flux conservation, after it contracts. 
And then we can compare that to the values of magnetic field inferred from the observations. And well, the, the evolution of the magnetic field is very complex and it would require uh, a very detailed modeling, but we can sort of see that our models are in the right ballpark, so to speak, uh, as the ones that are inferred from observations. So to have a second conclusion on this second project of the more energetic transients, uh, what we did was propose that superluminous supernovae and gamma rebirths can come from the same evolutionary channel of fast rotating stars that evolve chemically homogeneously. And this will lead to uh, an accelerated contraction at the end of a star's life that will uh, result in very, very high mass loss a few thousand years before the collapse. And we are able to reproduce with our model the properties of a superluminous supernova observed and interpreted through the magnetar model, such as their ejecta masses, the magnetar spin periods, and uh, a little bit the, uh, the magnetic fields that are inferred in these explosions. So since this has been a long, perhaps, talk, I'd like to summarize by reminding you that the main question that I was trying to answer with the projects that I've, uh, I've done is where do these hydrogen and helium deficient transients come from, considering that most of the stars are made almost entirely of hydrogen and helium. And for the normal supernovae, we found that they can come from helium stars, and we were able to explain what is the minimum luminosity of these stars to be observed as wolf rays or not in different metallicities. And with these models, we were able to predict the uh, distributions of ejecta masses of type 1c supernovae and trends for uh, the numbers of different types of wolf rays across different populations of stars. And on the other hand, for the very extreme transients, uh, we were able to, or we proposed that uh, these energetic transients, the superluminous supernovae and gamma ray bursts, come from a common channel that originates when stars rotate very fast and evolve chemically homogeneously as a consequence of rotational mixing. And these models were able to reproduce the properties that we observe in superluminous supernovae. So I think that was everything I wanted to say. Thank you for giving me this chance. And I'm looking forward to taking your questions and to hopefully discussing some more stuff in the future. Thank you, David. Um, questions? Do we have any questions for David? Uh, feel free to either raise a hand or just open your mic and ask. Can I ask a question, Vasa? Of course. Uh, OK. Uh, thank you, David. It was a very interesting talk. Uh, uh, the, uh, I, I cannot understand physically how um, a the formation of a magnetar mm -hmm. can, can lead to a superluminous supernovae. A, a magnetar is a neutron star with uh, an assumed super strong magnetic field. Um, so how then, that's the only difference with from other neutron stars. Yeah. Uh, so why this strong magnetic field induces uh, superluminous supernovae? Uh, great question. So what we believe happens when a supernova, a normal supernova explodes, is that very quickly as the core collapses, the, the material outside of the core will absorb some of the energy that is released during the formation of the proton-neutron star. And then what we will observe is how the layers that are expelled cool off and how the uh, radioactive material that is produced during the explosion decays. So this is what powers a normal supernova. Uh, in the case of a superluminous supernova, what people think is that they are made more luminous because as a magnetar is formed in this explosion that is very fast spinning, as it's very magnetic and it's accelerated due to the spin, it will inject energy into the outer layers from the decay of the magnetic field that is given from the, you know, from having an accelerated magnetic field. So, so you want simultaneously to create a magnetar 
and the magnetar must have a huge burst because uh, magnetars are observed to have to exhibit uh, to, 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 to exhibit huge bursts um, that are magnetic uh, somewhere in, in their lifetime. But here you want the two things to happen together. No, it's more like a continuous deposition of energy. So as the magnetar spins, since it's magnetic and it's accelerated because of the rotation, uh, these accelerated magnetic fields will lose energy continuously just as a dipole would, uh, which is, for example, the reason that we know that uh, uh, neutron stars spin down is because they lose energy because of this dipole radiation. And then this radiation is then absorbed by the ejected material from the supernova, and this makes it more energetic and therefore hotter and more luminous. Okay, and then the second question, um, the, the, uh, near the end, you showed a view graph with uh, a, ejected mass versus mm -hmm. period. That's okay. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, all right. I can go back. It's fine. It's very close. Uh, one before. That's it. Yeah. Now, um, the magnetars are observed to have periods from 2 to uh, 12 uh, seconds. Uh, so is this period, the spin period, measured after the supernova? When, when is this period measured? It's not directly measured from observations of magnetars, but it's rather inferred from the light curve models of these uh, superluminous supernovae. So the magnetars themselves are not directly observed because, first of all, uh, directly after the explosion, you would not be able to observe them because they're inside of the supernova remnant, if you want to call it that. Uh, but also, second of all, because uh, the supernovae take place in very, very far galaxies, and I don't think, uh, but if somebody knows better, please correct me if I'm wrong, that we can actually observe uh, magnetars or neutron stars, pulsars, in galaxies that are so far away. So these are inferred from modeling of the light curve. Okay, so it's modeling, and and the model and and the model assumes a dipole magnetic field that decays. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm not very happy with that, but uh, <laughs> that's a personal opinion, in the sense that uh, we have no observation, absolutely no observation, um, that that it. The, the magnetic the dipole magnetic field is doing the uh, it's an assumption that the p dot comes from from the decay of the magnetic field the okay. p dot in magnetars is assumed is assumed to come from a radiating magnetic dipole and the p dot then gives the the magnetic field but mm -hmm. um, this assumes that everything is in vacuum and which may not be the case and therefore um, uh, we really do not know. The only secure measurement of the magnetic field is the cyclotron line. And the only cyclotron line observed in a magnetar is, was interpreted as a proton cyclotron and the magnetic field was multipolar, not dipolar. So... Okay. Uh, okay, I'm just, this is a comment that uh, okay. I personally am I'm, I'm skeptical um, because if these were measurements, then it would be uh, it would be perfect. It would answer once and for all. But yeah, since these are models, uh, okay, um, all right. Yeah, no, it's not perfect, and in that sense, no, no, no. I, in the I, same I just... way goes from stellar physics because we haven't really observed stars that evolved this way. Uh, in stellar populations. So it's this all very is speculative. This is astrophysics. It's not laboratory yeah. physics. So it's exactly. okay. okay. <laughs> well, thank, thank you. you. Okay. Vasilis has a question. Yes, thank you. Thank you, David. This was a very interesting talk. I was just wondering uh, from the observational point of view, Mm -hmm. A couple of questions. First, you, you, the models demonstrate that uh, there is a change uh, in the expected uh, ratio of uh, type 1c and type 1b mm -hmm. increases with metallicity, right? But how do you actually measure it? 
this, right? Since you typically measure metallicity of a whole galaxy, uh, if I understand correctly, right? At least for the distance systems. Yeah, yeah. And also, you know, you, you can have uh, easily, at least theoretical models show that you can, uh, you can have one or two generations of stars that would pollute the neighborhood of the massive star forming region. So the fact that you will see variations in the ratio, uh, how easy it is to constrain it with metallicity from the observational point of view? Um, I think the, the kind of observations that we would hope to compare this with, which is something that has not been done yet, is with something that takes more into account like the whole picture. So for example, if we could see how these uh, transients, how the rates evolve, for example, as a function of uh, redshift, we can then infer what is on average the changing metallicity that goes between these uh, redshift, different redshift spaces. And then we can compare to an average of, you know, the populations of galaxies that we expect to see in there. So what would be what we would have to do to compare directly to observations is perhaps a little bit more complex than what I have shown here. This is just sort of a proof of concept that comes from a simple uh, stellar population analysis. Okay. And a, follow yeah. in, in a second question then maybe you you use a MESA, right? And as you mentioned, mm -hmm. these are uh, one dimensional models, right? Yeah. However, uh, one of the basic uh, concepts in your, in this interpretation is uh, rotation uh, mm -hmm. that uh, by definition is uh, has axis symmetry instead of uh, spherical symmetry. Yeah, of course. Uh, is there an uncertainty on that? Um, because the so instabilities the that, will be different during explosions, right? Yeah, no, of course. Uh, there's an uncertainty in, of course, how these explosions will take place. But the way that we have uh, taken that into account, so to speak, is through the tests of explodability that we made. So we made the assumption that these would be sort of like easier to explode a fast rotating star than it is uh, a non-rotating star, which is something that is also found in the simulations of uh, 3D supernova explosions in general. Um, and the way that MESA is modeling rotation is by using the fact that even though you will not have a spherical star because it's sort of compressed along the axis of rotation, um, you will have uh, sort of ellipsoids or sphere or yeah, some shapes that are concentric that have equal pressure. And these are all sort of like averaged quantities over uh, the surfaces of equal pressure. And then you can see where in these uh, layers you will have different processes of instabilities and so on that will then induce the mixing that is necessary for this channel to occur. But yeah, of course, you know, it's uncertain and all of these parameters are sort of derived from linear perturbation theory. So at some point, uh, perhaps these parameters are no longer valid to model what happens to a very, very fast rotating star or to a star that is very close to the Eddington limit, for example. But the physics that goes into the simulations, uh, perhaps these details are, you know, a little bit up in the air, but the way that uh, neutrino emission uh, takes place in fast, in massive stars is very well understood. So in that sense, the main physical ingredients that we have in these models are very robust, even though the details might change our results by, I don't know, 20% or so. This is sort of more a proof of concept kind of study. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions for David? Okay, so if there are no more questions at this time, let us all thank David very much again. Uh, we're very much looking uh, forward to having you here in person and continuing this discussion. Uh, take care and thank you everybody for joining. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks. See you in a couple of weeks. Yeah, see you very soon. <laughs>